We're studying this evening in section 32, XXX, I, I, healing Peter's mother-in-law and many others at Capernaum. We were speaking last Wednesday evening when we were here uh, about some of the miracles that Jesus began to do and that fame and reputation began to spread about Him. And tonight, the section that we're looking at uh, comes out of Matthew chapter 8, verses 14 through 17, uh, Mark chapter 1, 29 to 34, and Luke 4, 38 to 41. He had been in the synagogue there at Capernaum, and as we pick back up in the lesson this evening, and we read some, it says, And he arose out of the synagogue, and straightway when they were come out of the synagogue, they came entered in to the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Now Simon's wife's mother lay sick, was holden with a great fever. And when Jesus was come unto Peter's house, he saw his wife's mother laying sick with a fever. And straightway they tell him, and they besought him for her. And he came and he stood over her, <clears throat> excuse me, stood over her and rebuked the fever. And he touched her hand and took her by the hand and raised her up. And it, the fever, left her, and immediately she rose up and ministered unto him, or unto them, and one of the other, uh, Matthew says him, and Mark says she ministered to them, but uh, same concept or principle is is there. We're going to stop there for just a moment because we're going to be talking about this for a little while. You know, as we look at this particular section, and as we were discussing last week, as it was the Lord's custom on the Sabbath day, uh, He went into the synagogue, and since He was there at Capernaum, and that was where he was making his abode. Uh, <clears throat> on the Sabbath day, he had went in. Uh, he had done the miracle. And as we come down here, uh, when the service, uh, the worship, and the time at the synagogue uh, was over, uh, they left there, and we're told that they came to the house of Simon and Andrew, and they came uh, with James and John. And so Simon, or Peter, and Andrew were brothers. James and John, uh, the sons of Zebedee, and their fathers uh, were apparently all working together uh, in the fishing business, as we've already talked about. Now, whether they're partnership was an informal partnership. They were just working together because they were friends and partnered together to help one another, or whether it was more of an elaborate business arrangement. You know, again, that, that really, uh, to me at least, doesn't make that much difference. I mean, they, uh, they had worked together. And so coming out of the synagogue, uh, they went to the house of Simon and Andrew. And so this was their family's uh, house. This, uh, again, we're, we know that Simon's uh, father's name was Jonah. It's a good name for a fisherman, I think, Jonah. Uh, Simon, son of Jonah. Uh, and so... Whether this was really their father's house and they were living there with him, lots of the families were uh, together, extended families. James and John 
Um, you know, in, in the customs, the traditions of the Jewish people, the, there is a Sabbath evening's meal, which is Friday night. And so the family will many times bring and invite guests and friends around the Friday evening table. The women will prepare uh, the food and all ahead of time and have it ready so that when the Sabbath comes, and they also will, uh, and they have over the years developed ways to keep uh, food warm uh, into and through the Sabbath by putting it in clay pots and burying it in the ground uh, to kind of insulate it and keep it warm and edible. And, and so uh, we, we would normally in the tradition of the Jews see a Friday evening, as we think of it, Friday evening meal, that Friday evening meal is the Sabbath evening's meal. And then after their worship in the synagogue, uh, the day is devoted to relaxation. Uh, it's devoted to kind of a fellowship and engaging in one another and discussion of things that are holy. Uh, you know, it, it is a time away from work. And so, again, after uh, the service in the synagogue, it's, it's understandable that they would again spend the rest of the day uh, into the evening uh, in interacting with, with one another. And so uh, we see Jesus uh, going into the house. We see uh, it is the house of Simon and Andrew, his brother, and they have James and John with them. And so they uh, lived near. As we said, they, they worked uh, with one another in the fishing business. Uh, and so uh, we have this, this gathering. And I, you know, I don't know if that's all that necessarily were there, but we know that Peter and Andrew and James and John and Jesus was there. We know... Uh, you know, I would assume that since Peter's mother-in-law, his wife's mother was there, if uh, she was still alive and around, uh, and apparently according to Paul's writing to the Corinthian church, Peter did lead a, a sister wife uh, in, in the gospel. So uh, she was probably there. Uh, her mother was there. And so we, we kind of see a combining together of all of these, you know, these people. I don't know, like I said, if, if Jonah uh, was there and, and whether uh, James and John's father, uh, Zebedee, was there. And we have seen before in the discussion that they've had uh, employees, people who worked for them, so the, the Sabbath day was just a big day of relaxing, taking time, uh, enjoying one another, talking about aspects of the, the Torah, aspects of uh, you know, living a life acceptable unto God. And uh, many times, uh, you know, the, a lot who uh, were at the synagogue, of course, uh, were the men, the men in the synagogue directed uh, the worship, participated in the worship. There's, there's really not that much difference between the structure in the synagogue and the structure in the New Testament church. Uh, one is an extension really of the other. And so many times the women would not necessarily be in the worship, but many of those would uh, be there preparing and taking care of the children and doing other things, uh, getting ready for the, uh, the meal that day. And so when they returned back from the worship at the synagogue, uh, they find that Simon's wife's mother or Peter's mother-in-law lay sick uh, and uh, we're, we're told that it was with a, a great fever. And so as we would, would use it in today's terminology, she just burning up. And, and of course, 
at that time, uh, you know, really, it would have been a scary thing. You know, we uh, can use uh, ice and uh, different types of medications and all, and I'm sure they had some things, but fevers were very dangerous. Uh, to have a fever and to have a, a great fever, uh, which to me would be, you know, just drenched in, you know, lack of a better word, drenched in sweat, you know, burning up. And, uh, you know, that moves one into a place where, uh, you know, they may or may not be conscious, semi-conscious. We've kind of talked about this, I think, before, but... You know, when your temperature gets up to those points, you know, you're you're kind of moving into a point of where you're going to be unconscious. And if something doesn't happen, uh, it's, it's quite possible that you will will die. You will suffer some other major complications that uh, as your temperature goes up. Of course, uh, one of the things that's mentioned here by Brother McGarvey is, is, of course, those who are part of the Catholic Church say that the popes are not married and <clears throat> they claim that Peter was the first pope, yet he had a mother-in-law. And Peter says that he, uh, as well as some of the other apostles, led around uh, wives who were sisters in the church. And so this is one of those places where, uh, of course, I, I imagine by now they've got a better argument, but... Uh, that, you know, well, he was married before the church was established, and so, you know, they might tolerate that. But, you know, Peter did have a wife. He did have a mother-in-law, and apparently she was there at the house with them. And so we, we see a, a pretty good-sized gathering, which makes me <clears throat> at this time wonder about uh, Mary, his mother and about his brethren and the other people who uh, commonly associated with him, you know, where they were exactly at that time. It doesn't go into a lot of it because we're, the, the account is, is leading into the miracle here, of course, with uh, Simon's mother, mother-in-law. <clears throat> and when Jesus was come unto Peter's house, and notice we have different perspectives um, as to when uh, people said certain things. We mentioned a lot of times people say, well, you know, Matthew says this and Mark says that and, and Luke says this and, you know, which, you know, it looks like there's, you know, there's, there's a little bit of confusion. Well, again, no, there's no confusion. It's just people who were there were remembering things the way that it was seen to them when they heard, when they saw uh, various aspects. And of course, the writers tell us that uh, Jesus saw that his wife's mother was sick and somebody else was telling him about her condition. Straightway, they tell him of her uh, condition. Uh, and, and they were asking him uh, to do something to help her. And he came and stood over her and, and rebuked the fever, touched her hand, took her by the hand, and raised her up. And uh, the fever immediately left her. And this is uh, one of those places that when we look at the miracle and we think about you know, what happened and how it happened, you know, that somebody who was in a severe fever uh, when you know your fever breaks generally because your body has been pushed to its limits you know one is weak uh, sickly takes a while to kind of recuperate your electrolytes are off from a medical standpoint you know your your electrolytes can get messed up just a lot of things going on and I think we can all agree that the last thing we would want to do after laying in bed sick with a fever is to get up and take care of other people. Because I know mothers do that all the time. You know, mothers don't ever get sick. You know, they're always the ones who take care of the, the household. But, 
you know, this is just an example of how full and how complete the miracles were. And Jesus rebuked the demonic, the demon which was there, and cast him out. And the people were amazed and astonished that the, even the demons, or the devils, the evil spirits listened uh, to him and followed <clears throat> his command to, to leave. And this complete recovery emphasizes what a, a miracle is. Uh, again, a miracle is not taking an aspirin and feeling better 20 or 30 minutes later. You know, that's divine providence. That's the fact that God has given us the ability to use medications and treatments uh, and to bring about, you know, remedies and cures. But in this particular case, you know, he... Uh, he didn't give her medicine. Uh, he, again, says, rebuked the fever. He called it uh, uh, to, to leave. I mean, you don't know what caused the fever. Uh, generally speaking, there's some kind of infection, some kind of disease, but he do, we don't uh, go into all of that. But uh, she was uh, in uh, danger, you know, physically, and she shows her gratitude by getting up and ministering to uh, those who were there. And as we can see, it's a pretty good gathering. Now, I don't know, like I said, how many more were there, but we have a list of some of those who were specifically there. And then we're told at that evening when the uh, evening was come as the sun was setting as it did set all they that had any sick with divers or diverse diseases brought them unto him they brought unto him all that were sick and many that were possessed by demons and he laid his hands on every one of them and he cast out the spirits with a word and healed all of them that were sick. You know, as, as we look, Jesus spends the afternoon, the Sabbath afternoon there at Peter and Andrew's house with James and John. And as we have noted before, uh, Peter, James, and John, those three are spoken of on several occasions through the uh, scriptures at unique points in time of being with Jesus sort of privately. And so here Jesus is with Simon and Andrew, James and John. The other disciples may have returned back to their house. Um, but you know, he spends the afternoon, as would have been the custom of the Jews, in a time of fellowship, discussion. Uh, you know, we, I, I mean, I don't know what all took place, but you know, understanding Jewish customs and understanding that Jesus uh, was there with them, uh, you know, I would have a hundred different questions, you know, and having seen and heard and listened to him, uh, you know, I, Jesus may have just went over in the corner and sit down somewhere on a cushion and leaned over and had a, a Sabbath afternoon's nap. I, I somehow don't think that's probably what happened, but it could have, I guess. But more than likely, you have Peter and Andrew and James and John talking to him about aspects of the kingdom and his teachings and things that they have heard and things that they have seen and about the miracles, and I, to me, there would just be a, a million questions uh, to ask him. But we can see the, the the fact that it was the Sabbath afternoon, and so a Sabbath day's journey was was rather limited uh, in scope. And I don't remember exactly how far it was. If I if I remember correctly, it was somewhere around like 1,200 yards. Uh, you know, you weren't supposed to spend the Sabbath day exhausting yourself. You were supposed to rest. And so, uh, as I understand it, the distance 
uh, of a Sabbath day's journey was based on the encampment of Israel and the furthest tents from the tabernacle and the distance it would have taken to walk to the tabernacle where the worship of God would be conducted and then walk back to your tent. So you really didn't have a lot of extra stuff. Now, some of that were lived closer to the tabernacle, of course, they could have walked a little bit further. But what we see here is, is that the people have all went back to their different homes, the places that they lived. Uh, they have observed the Sabbath day. They have had their meal. They have followed the customs of their people. But the Sabbath starts on what we know as Friday evening at sunset. As the sun sets on Friday evening, that's actually the Sabbath evening, and it goes all the way to sunset on Saturday. And at the sunset on Saturday, that becomes the uh, Monday evening to us. Uh, that's the way you know they would have thought of it. And so they were, uh, those who were there uh, in the synagogue and around the synagogue and saw the miracle that Jesus did with the one who was possessed have went back to their respective homes. They've talked to their families. Uh, they have considered, you know, their friends, their families, you know, good old Joe across the street. You know, he could definitely... Uh, use some time with Jesus and, and you know, Sue and Mary and James and John or whoever that was around. All these different people, everybody knows somebody who's sick, suffering uh, with various ailments, people who have been hurt, harmed, you know, in, in that day, in that age, breaking bones and uh, bones mending back, again, easy to be crippled. Uh, and having various uh, problems. And so all through the day, they've had a chance to, to talk about it, to consider it, to speak to somebody maybe in their house uh, that uh, was, was suffering through various uh, problems. And as the sun starts setting, that becomes uh, the first day of the week. Now, technically, it's the evening, but it starts Monday. Um, or I'm sorry, Sunday, the first day of the week starts Sunday. Uh, and so uh, in days of the, the, the church, you know, you have Sunday starting at sunset on Saturday. So that, that starts the first day of the week or Sunday. And, uh, you know, as the sun starts setting, it's no longer the Sabbath, but it is Sunday, first day of the week. And as uh, the sun begins to set, people who have individuals who are suffering from uh, demon sickness, illness, various things begin to bring them to the house where Jesus is, which would imply that they knew that he had been spending time at uh, Peter and Andrew's house. And so they brought them to him uh, at the end of the Sabbath, beginning of the uh, Sunday, the first day of the week. And um, the uh, Luke records the fact that he laid his hands on every one of them. Uh, and Matthew says he cast out the spirits with a word and healed uh, all. And Luke adds uh, them. And uh, Matthew says all that were sick. And he speaks here of the fulfillment of the prophecy in Isaiah 53 and 4, speaking about Jesus saying Himself took our infirmities and bare our diseases. And uh, so... Here, here's another one of those situations. We've, we've seen miracles that Jesus did. All Jesus really had to do was say something 
uh, will something and they would be healed. But there, there seems to be a certain amount of compassion. Uh, you know, you, Jesus could have walked out on the front porch and saw all these people and He could have just went, be healed and devils flee and you know it would be gone. But it's interesting that Jesus took time to, uh, as, as I look at it, have a moment with these individuals. You know, He had that personal moment if it wasn't anything more than to just look in their eye and smile as He touched them and as He healed them. Just that, that little bit of a moment between those individuals. And so it isn't just about the miracles. The miracles confirm the things that were taught. Uh, but it seems that Jesus took time to, to show some compassion to interact with them on an individual basis rather than to treat them just as a, as a multitude or a group of people who were sim- assembled together. And so, you know, you have these people, I'm sure that, you know, I can see people raising their hands and calling to Jesus and their family and friends trying to get His attention. And so Jesus is walking among these individuals. I'm sure Peter and Andrew's house wasn't big enough to bring them all in. So he was out there walking among those people, seeing their families, smiling, you know, looking them in the eye, you know, grabbing the hand of the one who was who was sick. You know, I can just, you know, I, again, we, we don't have it written out here, but you know, he, he literally you know, laid his hands on every one of them. And so to me, that implies more than just performing miracles because that was not necessary. But, uh, you know, the, the interaction. And I think this perhaps is one of those things that uh, helped to build up his reputation and to get people who wanted to follow him because he did treat them as individuals. Um, you know, the scribes, and the Pharisees, and some of those, you know, they, they again saw them in various ways, but Jesus was only concerned about them. He wasn't interested in their money. He wasn't doing it for that. He wasn't necessarily doing it for fame or fortune. Uh, but again, he had compassion on the multitudes. And uh, as uh, Isaiah 53, that prophecy that we, that we find there, he, he took upon himself uh, our infirmities, bear our diseases. Uh, you know, he, he cured those things. And the fame and, and all of him scattered nonetheless. But I think more than anything else, he wanted that, uh, that compassion. You know, Jesus had compassion on them many times because uh, he described them in one place as, as sheep without a shepherd. You know, there, there wasn't that many people who really cared about them. You know, as long as you're paying your tithe at the temple and as long as, you know, you're keeping the commandments and all of that, uh, you know, there were plenty of people to smile and embrace you and, and do that. But again, when you weren't able to work anymore and it was difficult for you to, to give money and, and all of that, you know, we, we start seeing kind of a different perspective. And so... Many of these people perhaps had been shelved, had been, you know, in home. Some who were crippled and diseased, uh, you know, had had maybe been in their houses, uh, only interacting with their family. And now, 
you know, they're not only healed, but as we see in other places, they're able to stand up. You know, they're able to walk around, to go to the places that they've been before, see things, and He literally changed their lives. And so it's, it's for that reason that people began to uh, think about Him, talk about Him, and His fame began to spread from city to city. Uh, you know, if you have family in, in other cities, you know, this day, this Sabbath day, wasn't a, a time to, to walk to that other city. But after this Sabbath was over and after Sunday had came, the first day of the week and the rest of the week, these people who were healed, uh, you know, their families talked about it, the reputation, the things went on. Uh, into the other cities and places, and they began to seek Jesus. And uh, in verse 33 here, it says, And all the city was gathered together at the door. Uh, you know, Peter and Andrews, they were there. Uh, you know, some were there because they had people who were sick. Others were there perhaps to see what he would do about these others. Some uh, were probably uh, assisting friends, family in bringing, caring, those who couldn't walk, those who were sick. And so uh, the end result was that uh, you know, it may not from a head count be all in the sense that every single one of the city was there, but it does at least imply that from all over the city there of Capernaum, from all points or all places in the city, uh, people came and He healed those who were sick of various diseases, casting out demons. The demons also came out from many crying out saying, Thou art the Son of God and rebuking them. He suffered them not to speak. That is, the demons or the evil spirits who uh, wanted to confess Jesus. They knew Him. Uh, Mark says that they confessed Jesus and professed to know Him, uh, that He was uh, Christ. Now, as we've mentioned before, Jesus... Uh, and especially in his early ministry, uh, did not go about confessing and professing that he was the Messiah, even though some along the way would begin to consider that. And it was interesting that he revealed himself to the woman at the well as the Messiah, and he revealed himself as the Messiah to those of Samaria. But these individuals he suffered not to speak or to talk. And this seems to be an interesting thing that goes along. Uh, those who have came back uh, from the dead have not left information to us as to exactly what is on the other side. Paul speaks about one who was called up into the third heaven and he saw many things. Uh, uh, of which he was unable or, or not permitted uh, to speak. Uh, at the time that, uh, especially Brother McGarvey brings out, uh, if you wonder why maybe he brings this out, uh, he talks about those who have a, 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 are disposed to go to seances and uh, mediums and to, we might add to that Ouija boards and card readers and gypsies and fortune tellers. These these individuals have uh, again, you know, many of them have scammed many. But during the time that Brother McGarvey was writing in the uh, 1800s, the early part of the 1900s, spiritualism was a big thing. Uh, in the United States and in Europe, uh, there were many people who were going around saying and performing seances and get you in touch with your dead husband, mother, children, whatever. 
Um, we hear that uh, even Abraham Lincoln's wife uh, had mediums who she consulted after the death of their son. Spiritualism and, and that kind of thing was big, uh, especially when Brother McGarvey was writing. And so he just makes a passing comment that you know Jesus did not allow the demons, the evil spirits, to confess or profess or to teach or say anything uh, about him uh, or the other side. You know, they were quieted. They were told to hold their peace and not to speak. And so uh, Brother McGarvey brings up a point at the, the <clears throat> after all this that um, that was valid even more so at that time of course, today we still have people who believe in ghosts and and all these kind of things, and that there are people who come back uh, to their family and and all of that. But uh, you know, the the whole concept behind that is, is spiritualism. Of course, Jesus gives us the discussion of Lazarus uh, and the rich man, and Jesus uh, tells us, you know, as we're seeing in a conversation between Lazarus and, and Father Abraham uh, that uh, you know, they would not allow someone to come back to warn their family or their loved ones to, uh, to repent and, and turn and to warn them about what waits on the other side. And so you know, if God's not going to allow them to come back for that, He's probably not going to let somebody come back just to, to uh, again, aggravate you or taunt you or whatever. Um, but, you know, we, we see that many today try to get into this same concept. Spiritualism has not completely gone away. It's just kind of been repackaged. Uh, but there are things on the History Channel and other places that we see from time to time, ghost hunters and all this, people trying to go into places where they believe that there is a lot of paranormal, as they call it, activity. Uh, and it just does not make sense biblically that if Jesus was not willing to allow people at that time, even at the time of miracles, these spirits and, and all to confess and profess and teach. He most certainly is not going to let them get involved into all of that today. Uh, again, we, we talked about last week. I don't know to what extent it may be possible to open your life up to uh, this, uh, the, the evil uh, side. But uh, again, we, we clearly see that Jesus was not interested in having the demons and devils and spirits and uh, disembodied souls of those in the Hadean realm coming back preaching and teaching things. Does anybody have any questions or comments down it's through? Similar to what we talked about at the start of the lesson or tonight or about that, you know, the other church come in. Jesus wouldn't let them come in and speak and talk. Yeah. You know, we're, if, if you're not going to be able to do it for good, he's not going to let it be done for evil. That's the. And of course, lots of people make lots of money off of, of, of people who want to get in touch with their loved ones and, you know, to get some type of insight about the future. Uh, you know, I don't know. I. I really don't pay much attention to all that, but I know there used to be a horoscope in the paper, and people would read your horoscope every day. And again, that's that's kind of again the same thing. Astrology, uh, you know, the the alignment of the planets somehow affect how you know our our lives go. And so, uh, mankind has tried to uh, to deal with that kind of thing probably from the very beginning to try to gain. You know, astrology and astronomy, those are two different things, but they are also connected. And so lots of people, uh, again, still are, are in some way connected with astrology. In closing this evening, we wish to thank you again for spending your time in study with us. 
We hope the lesson has been uplifting and motivational. We encourage you to return again for our next lesson. Until then, may we invite you to visit our website. You will find many study opportunities. Our resource page has links to the Gospel Broadcasting Network, a 24-7 station with many great Christian programs and speakers. In Search of the Lord's Way, with Brother Phil Sanders. We have two links for Bibles and downloadable software. If you are looking to really expand your knowledge, perhaps you might like to try World Video Bible School, a college-level learning site free of charge. So, until next time, may God bless and keep you in His care as we walk together in His truth. And remember as always, the Churches of Christ salute you.